Hi there, I guess we should get going. Um, I'm thrilled to see so many 500 students here. Uh, after all of my nagging, thank you for coming. Uh, and it's very good because we're going to begin uh, uh, this lecture with the announcement of the Schenck Woodman Awards. Of course, we've, this, these have already been announced, but this is the official one. Um, and I see that many sitting in the crowd actually won awards, so that's great. <laughs> um, uh, this year, the, the Schenck Woodman addressed um, designs. Uh, the Schenck Woodman is a bit of a kickoff for the semester. This is to Lori. Um, where we come up with a design project, the faculty, and assign it to the students in order to begin the issues of the semester. Uh, and so it's always in the area that we're working in. It also has kind of um, attributes, certain kinds of, um, I don't know, obsessions on design that we, we like to address. This one was for a design of a streetery, two streeteries uh, in a part of the city called Callow Hill, North Chinatown, uh, that we are now working on. Uh, and so we have, this is a very well endowed um, competition. I think we gave out over $25,000 to our, to our winning team, so it was great. Um, uh, and I'm pleased to announce that just about everyone in the class got an award. <laughs> We had um, three first place teams. Uh, the Nest by Team 5, uh, uh, who was Bo Han Lang, Ross McKenzie, and Chin Nguyen. Uh, food Chain uh, by Team Number 17. And, oh, okay. You ready to go? Yes, this is the Nest. This is Team Number 5. This is one, one of the number one uh, entries. Food Chain by Number 17, uh, Danny Jarabek. Toby Sumek and Owen Wang. Lantern Within the City by Team 19, Francisco Anaya, Telman Baishaglan, and Zihan Lee. Second place, uh, Pop Up by Team Number 6, Chi Yi Huang, Ravina Puri, and Valerie Tsi. Porch Works, Team Number 20, another second place, uh, Changyang Chan, Wan Wan Lin, and Kelvin Vu. Uh, the last second place uh, is uh, Porch Works. Team num oh no, that, sorry, that was team number 20. The last one is The Glaze by team number 23. Chengnan Gao, Maxwell Lent, and Shi Yi Chi. And then there was a host of honorable mentions. A transitory permanence, uh, Rachel Seto, Kang Truong, Shi Yi Zhang, uh, honorable, oh no, I'm sorry, that was another second place. Uh, honorable mentions, Resurge, team number nine. Shi Xuang Song, Sophie uh, Waj, oh, I'm gonna butcher this, I'm so sorry. Waja Lewich, where is Sophie? <laughs> sorry, Sophie. <laughs> and Grace Infante. Uh, honorable mention on the Axis, team 18, Jessica Wong, Si Yu Gao, and Wei Jun Peng. Uh, breathing Clouds, team number 22, Hedy Mao, Shen Yi Zhang, and Xiao Yu Zhou. Industrial Consumption by team number 24, Luigi Lu, Diego Martin, and Jun Yu. Uh, and the last honorable mention team, uh, Daniel Lutzi, Bo Yu Chiao, and Rong Zhan Zhou. Congratulations, everyone. They were just wonderful entries, as you can see. Uh, and we're really proud of our first year students for doing this great high quality work. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you, Annette. And thank you, Daniela, our two uh, coordinators for first year. And of course, warmest congratulations to the students. Absolutely stunning work. Really happy you won these awards. Um, and uh, Proud of you. So, with that, uh, congratulations again. Uh, we're going um, forward. To, do we have another slide? <laughs> can I do it? Back one. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. <laughs> we're going to the presentation. Oh, that was interesting. Am I standing on something? 
to keep it exciting, right, and keep you all awake. Um, Smith, Miller, and Hawkinson, my, one of my favorite offices in New York City, um, done absolutely, one of, actually, this is, this is kind of interesting, you know, for all the people I know, there's very few architects that actually built in Manhattan, which is not an easy thing to do. And their office is one of the few that builds absolutely beautiful things in Manhattan. And so I thought it was time that um, Lori came and showed us their beautiful work. Um, also, of course, what is amazing for any office that is important um, in the architectural scene, a lot of people that we know have worked there. So um, Annette Fierro worked there, uh, Feta Colaton worked there, Vanessa Keith worked there. <laughs> And Kevin Cannon worked there, so it's quite an amazing. Yes. And Marion worked there, so quite a quite a group of uh, people you know are, um, are came through this office. And this is, you know, how we all learn. I think it's a very important thing for all of us uh, architects to be able to count on our uh, more experienced uh, counterparts that take us up in their offices and teach us. So with that, I am not introducing Lori because I asked um, Feda to do that for me. But I just wanted to say thank you, Feda, for introducing Lori. And Lori, so happy to have you. Thank you, Winka. Welcome, Lori. And yeah, as you guys have heard, actually, a whole bunch of us could have done today's tonight's introduction. Um, but it is my distinct pleasure that it's going to be me. Um, it's a pleasure particularly to introduce Laurie Hawkinson, not only because she is an outstanding architect, academic, and educator, but as you heard, she's also a dear friend and a mentor of mine. Laurie was my professor at Columbia University, and after graduating, I ended up working for her and her partner, Henry Smith Miller, for five years. During that time, Lori also invited me to teach as her assistant at Columbia, effectively kickstarting my own academic career. Thank you very much for that. Um, during my time at SMNH, I learned many things from Lori. To think of architecture as a truly collaborative effort, for instance. Her office was, and I'm sure still is, a place where engineers, artists, photographers, architects, and other creatives would constantly meet and mingle, stew over projects, and push each other to challenge personal and disciplinary boundaries. I also learned to show equal attention to all aspects of design, no matter how minute. Each project's value was always seen equally in its totality, as well as in the various interactions of its parts, details, and materials. I also understood how to manage the delicate intersection between academia and practice. The ease with which Laurie moved from a client meeting in the morning to teaching grad students in the afternoon, only to head back to the office for another design session with one or two project teams, demonstrated not only remarkable stamina on her part, but also showed how her design ideas had the flexibility to address issues ranging from the ideal and conceptual to the programmatic and functional. Given the culture of her practice, it is no surprise that Laurie's body of work is spanning many scales and typologies and includes infrastructural, institutional, and residential designs. What unites all of them, in my opinion, is an unwavering commitment to challenging architecture's conventional boundaries and to produce excellent design. The numerous awards Smith, Mill, and Hawkinson architects have received, including AIA State and AIA New York Chapter Awards, as well as the AIA New York Chapter Medal of Honor, PA Awards and the New York Design and the American Institute for Steel Award, attest to the success of their approach. Laurie is an architect and the co-founder of the internationally acclaimed firm Smith, Mill, and Hawkinson Architects situated in New York. She is also a professor of architecture at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. At Smith and Hawkinson, she led the design for the Corning Museum of Glass, the North Carolina Museum of Art, Amphitheater, and Master Plan, 
I believe, in collaboration with the artist Barbara Kruger, that one, a wonderful project. The Wall Street Ferry Terminal, the land port of entry at Messina, New York, for the GSA, and the Zuriga Avenue EMS station for the city of New York. Currently, Lori leads the Energy Advancement Innovation Center project, an experiential hub for energy research and technology incubation at The Ohio State University. Lori holds an undergraduate and master's degree in fine arts from the University of California at Berkeley and received her professional degree in architecture from the Cooper Union, where she received the John Haydock Distinguished Alumni Award. She is a member of the Contemporary Arts Council at the Museum of Modern Art and a founding member of the board of directors at the Wooster Group. So those of you who don't know, it's an exper experimental theater group. Um, amazing, amazing group. Uh, Lori also serves currently on the Public Design Commission for New York City. Um, with that and no further ado, I would like you to help me welcome Lori Hawkins. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Here's my clicker. I have to leave this on. Okay. I'm leaving it on. So thank you, Vinka, and thank you, Ferda. It's so nice to be here. Um, and Vanessa and Annette and Marion, we're very early. We're very early. <laughs> she was right out of Yale. Um, anyway, I just, I wanted to do this talk to talk about you know, public works, capital, and then the private practice, kind of those two things together. And, you know, as an architect, I don't know, I, do, I don't know why it's doing that, but anyway, here we go. Oh, well. um, I wanted to speak about, you know, kind of the trajectory of the work and where, you know, we started and kind of, but really to talk about a particular project at the end that we're working on um, and a kind of process that we're involved in working on that. Because I thought as students, you might be, maybe more interested to kind of see how a project develops. These are a number of people that worked in our office over the years and others who aren't mentioned, but you know, as Ferda and Vinka said, an architecture office, an architecture office is really a big collaborative event. And it's so much fun to work with all these people and also to work with the, the really talented consultants that we work with, the engineers, you know, the mechanical engineers, the environmental engineers, uh, the civil engineers, you know, it's just a pleasure, the lighting, the lighting consultants, because you get to really trade hats when you're working um, and, you know, kind of think through there and they, they tell you, you know, what you're doing wrong and vice versa, but not always. Anyway, it's, it's just, um, you know, great, a great experience. And these are the people who are really kind of key in our office right now. Um, and, you know, some people have gone and come back, but it's a great group and, and really we owe a lot to all of them for this work. So uh, it was mentioned that, you know, we started out doing small work. This is a project, and I just wanted to kind of take you through really quick trajectories because maybe you can see, you know, how that reflects back or into the current work. So this was for Art on the Beach, um, which is for the public um, on Lower Manhattan. This is actually sand before the Battery Park City was there, and it was done with an artist, Erica Rothenberg and John Malpede, and it was called Freedom of Expression National Monument, and it was for... It was meant for the public to step up and speak out and basically yell back at the city whatever they wanted to yell. And then it was later, a number of years later, it was reconstructed down by the courthouses for um, the Republican National Convention when they wanted to bring some public art fund, wanted to bring some art, um, a, a creative time, I should say, wanted to bring art back into the city. So, you know, this is one of the kind of early projects and I want to kind of bracket that with something at the end, but just to kind of show you know, where we came from. And we, you know, we worked on lofts. You know, we started working interiors because we were downtown Manhattan. Um, we worked for a company called New Line Cinema and we worked for them for a very long time. And, you know, it really kind of helped take our, our office for, for quite a long run. And this is, but in these projects, you know, we were always looking for things, you know, that were kind of what, you know, kind of moments where we could really explore um, our interest. Um, Lower Manhattan, Wall Street Ferry Terminal, a very, very tiny building, one of the first ferry buildings built in Lower Manhattan. So it's a little building that's trying to be much bigger than it is through this very large 60-foot-long um, um, airplane hangar door that was connected to it. And just we thought of this project as, 
you know, this, it's the gray in the middle of the pier, just kind of clips on the edge and left the majority of the space to be open because there's very little open space in lower Manhattan. We wanted that to be this kind of surface for um, people to just walk from out of their offices, have lunch and what have you. So there you can see it clipped on. We made very large letters that could, you could see it from a distance as you're coming in on the ferry. And I thought of it as this kind of, you know, aircraft carrier that was waiting, anticipating things that might happen um, on that open surface. And this is the, the door <laughs> as it opens and it, it really tries to extend this building to be much bigger than it is in the space. Uh, this is a photograph by Arietta Atali, who, who took a number of, you'll see black and white photos through her, through this um, presentation, but this is one of hers that I love because it shows how thin that surface is between the inside and outside. And we were trying to really, like through a number of the projects, we're looking at finding that continuity, that continuous condition from outside to inside. Um, and then, uh, you know, just the kind of extension of the door as it opens up. So that idea of that thinness, and this is a model that I think Ferda made, if I'm not mistaken, but <laughs> um, this is a model for Corning um, in the very beginning where we were charged with creating this kind of new entrance to the building, a new piece on the front of the museum up in Corning, New York. And, you know, the thought was, one of the ideas, because I realized when we first drove up there to see the site, I kept thinking, you know, I was kept looking and thinking, where is the glass? Like, where? I kept scanning the landscape for glass. I kept thinking, it's got to be glass here somewhere. And so that was something that we tried to demonstrate at the entry, where you'd see glass on edge and you'd create this extenuated surface, kind of, I mean, condition of entry, and the structure would move from inside to outside in a kind of, to create an ambiguity about that inside and outside. Um, and, and you slide between those planes of glass, but you actually, we worked very hard to get that green edge of the glass and not have the black goop there at the edge. Um, so the love, this is, and also this notion of kind of extenuating the landscape into the building and the underside of the ceiling, which, you know, goes out and becomes an overhang on the exterior, was something obviously in that, that Pier 11 that we were also working with. And, and again, this continuity from inside to outside to create this surface that um, creates that ambiguity. And then this, I think, is one of your details, which is um, a handrail. So, so even the handrail, you know, becomes this moment of expression of, in this case, you know, expressing the glass, kind of moving it off of the 90 degree. The, the facade is, I think, seven degrees off of the vertical. So it's kind of, is it falling or righting itself? That's what we were you know, working with, so there was this tension when you came in, and so, you know, there were moments on the, um, some of the elevated walkways where, you know, the, the railing kind of opens up to the view. Uh, one of Arietta's photographs of that inside and outside condition. And then in the corner, this is, this is Ferda's piece at the back, but, you know, creating a transparency, but at the, oh, I get to use the pointer, so up here, what, they, what was worked on here was this condition of actually having the glass underneath the structure, right? It's kind of hanging underneath. So we're trying to find moments um, where the glass becomes almost didactic, right, throughout, throughout this building before you get in. And then a, um, an orientation, uh, it's a little digital theater in which the back of the theater is glass. Uh, the, there's a film that takes place and then you, you see the film and then at the end, because there's a screen, the screen lifts up and then you realize you're looking through glass, you're looking back into that space where the, where the Chihuly sculpture was. Um, they actually wanted to cut this out of the project when they were doing value engineering, this is for all the architects, um, and I traded carpet right here <laughs> for glass, so I hang, we hung on to it. Um, and then that's that volume of that digital theater. But very recently, uh, this was transformed into a hot glass theater. So we came back and we cut a hole in Ferda's wall and brought daylight in. Did you know that? We operated on this space and we cut it open so when you're on that walkway where that handrail was, you now can see in. And so we did this dental surgery on our project and made this, the big purple blue cut was a solid wall and we bring daylight in. Um, so kind of a similar condition here at Ohio where we're adding on to this 
And these are really brutalist buildings. We had a, a Wallace Harrison building that we were adding onto it at Corning. In this case, um, we're, we're kind of putting this new piece on this precast building that is on just right off of the oval at Ohio State University. And, you know, this tremendous amount of circulation going back and forth across the campus here. They're cutting through, and this is the corner um, there where we're kind of operating. And we wanted to work um, here with this kind of vocabulary of the precast, but then for our edition, you know, just kind of thinking, well, what, what can we do today with this material that we, we couldn't do when this was, and maybe they could do it. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous to say you couldn't, but, you know, we started to experiment with this precast panel um, and we wanted to make a very soft kind of curtain-like instead of this, this kind of hard, you know, window frame that was on the upper building, but that they would share that same system, but that it would be uh, expressed very differently. Uh, so we started, um, let's see, I don't know why it's not happy. It's just not happy. I don't know why it's doing that. It's like flying around here but I'll try it. Well, I can see it here. It's still on the stream. Am I st standing on something? It's like, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, right? Maybe I should be advancing it with this thing. Do you think that would help? Oh no, it doesn't even like this. It doesn't really like this. There it is. There it is, I'll go back one. Okay. I, to I was telling Hannah that I once spoke in Mexico City and my whole slide tray f was flipped upside down and went into people's coffee. So this is not bad. <laughs> this is not bad at all. <laughs> I don't know. You don't have a slide tray? No slide trays. Remember slide trays? Mystery. I could go back and see. There it's there. And then it doesn't like that slide. I don't know why. Okay. I could turn this around. <laughs> I know the, well, I can go to this. Can I go back one or I don't dare? I don't go back, okay, I'm sorry. The other one was fun, but I won't go there. So anyway, we started, so we bought a $27 wire cutter, like you guys use the phone cutters, and we cut these profiles to try to, you know, get this condition that we were trying to achieve of this very soft curtain condition for the, um, the precast panel. Oh dear. It doesn't like to be changed. This is on, right? This is on. Stick to the remote. Stick to the remote. I don't know. It's not happy. It's really not happy. Okay. Well, what's a workaround? Okay. I'll try one more. It doesn't like going to the next one. Should we take a break? Have a coffee? Mm -hmm. Is it connected? I, I see it on the laptop. No, it's still connected. I think it's probably, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna say, I don't know. I'm gonna step away. No, we'll see it, turn it off. I was gonna suggest that. Turn it off and turn it on. This is their laptops. I have a laptop. I think it's a laptop or the connection? No, the connection keeps coming out. That's the pro and then it takes a minute to reconnect. So use the remote control. Use the remote. Yes. There. Uh, That's what I want to show you. So this is our So, so this is us experimenting with those phone profiles in the office. 
I know. Okay, so then, you know, we sent those out. We got the, pe the pieces made. We went to Columbus to look at them in the light because you always want to look at them in the light of the place where you're working because the light's very different in New York. So we looked at them and then we changed some things. And then these are some of the profiles that we ended up working with. We had four panels. So what's happening is that the edge pieces are all the same dimension. So we could flip these around and we could get actually more combination than one would get by just layering them, right? Um, this is the construction drawing. You wouldn't have this today, by the way, because you would have a, a very ugly Revit file. I just say ugly in quotes. But um, so you're seeing, what you're seeing here is the, um, the form, right? And then there's the, the cast piece. And there it is going on the truck. So you have to figure out it's got to fit on the back of a flatbed, right? Because it's got to get to the site. And there, you know, dropping it in place. And then we had excavated some of the existing building so that it slides in. Um, and then, I love to see something that's so small, so big. So then where the, the kind of softness ends, right where, it, before, that's the kind of base piece, right before it hits the ground. So, you know, trying to control all of that. And so this is the guy. This is the guy. So it's kind of twisting and taking you in. And then this curtain's on the, on the two sides. So now we have these, so we mentioned that we did these port of entry projects. These are like airports on the ground. So they're, we got these two projects almost at the same time. I don't think they actually wanted to give us two projects, but anyway, I won't go into that, but we got two projects. They're very large projects at the Canadian border and they're, they're land port of entry. So like an airport, you drive through it, right? You go to Canada, you drive through these. Um, so they're, they're very large sites. This is one of the documents from uh, Champlain, and you're, it's a number of buildings, and it's a lot of asphalt. You try to get as much permeable as you can in there, and then you're managing the flow of the water over the site. You know, there's all kinds of wild things going on, in the, and then the number of, you know, vehicles that are going back and forth. So at Champlain, this was the site we got up there, and this is us looking at the building that was there, and we noticed that when you're going from Canada into the US, you're looking at the shadow of the building. The building's facade is in shadow. And so we realized, oh my God, you know, that's terrible. You know, what are we gonna... <laughs> so that became a kind of idea that we started to work with where we could bring this light from the south into that facade, right? And bring it in onto that, that north facade. So here's what that, that detail ends up looking like. There's the section of it, and then the, um, the vertical glass, um, the channel glass is the facade. So you're, you're getting southern light on the northern facade. And these are really, um, there's a lot of very pragmatic stuff in these buildings and at this site, but there's so much that you can get a lot of architecture in, I think. There's a lot of room for architecture. So um, here's that facade with that light. Um, we did a whole number of series of canopies that I'm going to talk about here for a minute, and this is going to take you into some other projects, but um, that's that light. And then, you know, the detailing of strip windows on kind of, gener kind of generic cor corrugated uh, facades. Uh, we, this detail at the base, we decided to try to have no curbs, curbs, C-U-R-B-S, no curbs. This was a design idea, to have no curbs in either of these projects because, first of all, they're horrible because people, they just do terrible concrete work on them. And then, you know, the building sits on this little... Ugh. Anyway, so we, we convinced them because of all the snow that we had to move all the snow around and so the curbs would just be in the way. We can't have curbs. So there are no curbs in any of these projects. Um, this is, um, you know, kind of looking out from a forensics lab, there's the kind of condition where you have like blinders that are skylights to bring the light into neighboring offices. Like instead of being blinders, there's skylights, side lights. And then there's um, these canopies that we, we got very involved with. And we were thinking, you know, how thin could we make these canopies? Because they're tremendous. And they're very important because that they keep the weather off of the transaction that happens. 
as you cross over with the, um, the people in the, um, that are examining. And we had done, Annette might recognize this, this is North Carolina Museum of Art where we had an outdoor amphitheater, an outdoor cinema, and we had a canopy here that we developed with Guy Nordenson um, with these kind of walking legs, these walking structure. Uh, part of some of the letters are up on the roof. I'll show you the letters. This is in the outdoor cinema. That's the little booth where, where the film takes place. This is that outdoor canopy, some corrugated, some solid, and then there's all kinds of things happening here. So this was done with the artist Barbara Kruger, and this is the, and uh, Nicholas Quinnell, landscape architect, but you can't, I don't know, this is a very funky aerial photograph, um, but actually part of the letter H, that's where it's cut out, is on the canopy. It just doesn't show up in this poor quality, but, so these, these letters are um, 80 feet long, right? But you don't really see them when you're in this, so you can see how they're kind of all, uh, not necessarily so obvious, but that's a whole other story. So these, but I wanted to talk about the canopy and this structure because it became something that we took. So this idea of kind of bringing ideas from one project to another that we're continually working on. Uh, we're working with these, these kind of moving columns and breaking them up so that they're lighter. You don't have one big hard so solid piece, but they're lighter and thinner, right? And then the thin canopies that are just steel plate there it's just three eighths inch steel plate that's all it is um these are those canopy pieces that are cut and then they you know there's the, the the posts the columns you know that slip onto onto base pieces and here's one of the um this is for uh the truck passing so it has to be higher on this side the commercial it's called and all these the idea is that these there's this movement that happens you're kind of pulling the movement of the trucks through with the, with, with the way the structure is, is moving. Um, before this, we had done a canopy, we'd done a project for Continental Airlines where we were involved with a number of things that you get, you touch as you move through an airport. Um, so at, at LaGuardia, this building is not here anymore, we did a canopy with Guy Nordenson uh, that's made of uh, Kevlar and carbon fiber. So this is super thin. And the glass here, there's a glass triangle. It's working in tension and compression. Gla Guy was really excited about this. He said the first time it had been done. Um, but we took some of this thinking into these other projects. This is a, actually a hand drawing of this canopy by Eric Cobb. Um, but we, we tried to bring that thinness here to Champlain. And we were thinking of just a kind of folded paper origami. Right, it's going to be strong. We know it can be strong, but we thought we could try it with steel. Um, this is kind of the work points, you know, of a of a drawing showing how it it, it uh, gets assembled, <clears throat> and then drawings from Arup where we're looking at the um, really you know the places where there's the most stress, obviously at the edges of the cantilever, and then you know the fabrication of those pieces, which have to all fit again on a flatbed truck. Right? They all have to break into pieces and then be welded up on site. There's a drawing of those, those work points. Um, here it is put together. Um, and then there's a second series of canopies at Messina. So this is the other station that we did at the port of Messina. And in this case, we thought of making the canopy be like a giant light fixture where we light up into the thing. So we, use, we have the whole underside of it is really functioning as a reflective surface. And they have to have very high foot candles here. Like, I don't know, it's like, it's like crazy. It's like 200 foot candles or something because they need to, the people, you know, they need to look in your car. You know, all kinds of stuff's going on that you don't really know about but um, they, they need a high level of visibility. So here at the secondary, um, if you actually end up here, you, you don't ever want to end up here. You'd be in trouble if you ended up here. So this is where they bring your car and then they might take it apart or something. But we had to have a very huge canopy. Um, or or we, we convinced them that they needed this very huge canopy and that it would be, again, uplit, no curbs, no curbs, uplit um, to kind of create this incredible, you know, working space outside. And there's that canopy. It's wild, and, um, pardon? It's steel, and they, they bondo the steel, like a car, and then, you know, work it, because I'll show you the construction drawing of it. But you, you know, if you get taken in here, that's where your car gets taken apart. So you don't wanna go there. 
but basically you're coming through, you end up here, and then you go. So here's the section through that. So you can see that you, um, what we're doing is tapering to get to this very, very thin edge so we get that appearance of that lightness, even though it's obviously you know, in the center where you can't really feel it because you're under it and you don't know its thickness. Um, so this tapering happens on all sides. And this is the rain gutter right there. So you have a little like a place for the rain to come. So this is Sean Gallagher, if anybody knows Sean Gallagher. He did this, he actually works for DSR. He's really good. So here's it getting assembled. Again, the pieces have to come in those dimensions. They're so cold up there. Imagine touching the steel. It's like, this is one of the places where they say it's like 38 below, you know, in New York, and it's usually Messina. So this is at the, um, you know, where the, where the um, passenger cars pass through, the administration building. Again, you, wouldn't, you would never go in there. You know, you would never go in there unless there's something wrong. But um, one of the things we developed at the facade was because there's this, there's a security issue, security issue here, but also the question of bringing light in, bringing natural light in. So we, we made a double skin, so we have a concrete block, but then we get clearer stories. And then some of these we actually cut into the wall, but the, the polycarbonate provides this uh, layer of transparency and translucency for bringing um, light in from, in this case, from the north again. And then here it is under construction, so you can see, and we took the letters of the United States and we brought them up under the transparency, translucency, so that they, they kind of glow at night. And we used, um, it's the material, this metal that's on yield signs, you know, that metal, just like the sign is made out of in that color, so we, that was what we used to make the big letters. So you see, we learned from Barbara. <laughs> Um, and then here's inside the building, um, in that, in the, um, right outside of passenger cars, and then, you know, some of the structures, truss turn sideways for lateral bracing, the, the polycarbonate, and then this idea of the no curbs. <laughs> um, we also had this idea of uh, yellow, the yellow being, um, we worked with pentagram, of being this area where it was safe to walk, where people could go. So it was this wayfinding system, so wherever there's yellow, it was safe. So here's a crazy drawing by Sean Gallagher of all the yellow in the project. And that you, you, know, you find it in buildings, so it kind of leads you into buildings, it leads you up to buildings. You know, it's, it's a place that it's safe if you're a pedestrian. So here's the site, and there's the yellow, and the no curbs, and a lot of, infrastructure for um, water because we were, we had to, re, we had to keep the, the existing port over here while we're building this new, there's a river to the south and we're actually making sure that the water can move and run and all the drainage can move back to the river and also be caught in cer certain areas and retained in, in um, bioswells. So this is a kind of early on photo. Here's some of the, um, that yellow you know, that you would, you kind of walk across the white, and then there, this is all safe to walk on. Safe <laughs> to walk. Because <laughs> see, it's all about cars moving and trucks moving, so you know, you're kind of, where do I walk? Um, some details of the buildings. This is one of Henry's handrails that just uh, kind of takes you up into this space where um, secondary or the commercial vehicles are, you know, just kind of, you know, connected right on to and a kind of a, a funky edge there. This is a building for customs, yellow inside, so you know, and you kind of move here and go in. Uh, this building has, we couldn't, there's no, the fire suppression system, we couldn't put in the ground because the water table was so high. So we had to put it, we decided to put it in the building. So this is really the fire suppression system. It, it, and uh, you know, this is some bioswale out here, but it's also, what it's doing is, it's a kind of, it's a counterweight. This, is, this column is working in tension, and this, this one is working in compression. This is compression, this is tension, right? Holding it down, right? Sorry, holding it down, correct? Not propping it up. And then this is the kind of counterweight to that piece. So that's the facade on the exterior, so you're seeing 
some of that structure. Those are those tension columns. They're really props. And then it you know, kind of appears that this whole roof is floating, which is what we were... So these were some of the things we were interested in trying to achieve here were these, these floating conditions. And these are, I love this kind of very sinister view of this at night, two buildings. So I'm gonna show you the second building, which is um, a truck scanning building, <laughs> a whole building for scanning trucks. Um, and again, this one is a cantilever, there's props. Um, and the, we, we convinced them they wanted to buy a butler building just something off the shelf, oh, we can buy a butler building. And we said, no, no, we can build something for the same price as a butler building. So we did, somehow we did it. But um, so there's, you know, just, this is all about just scanning a truck. So the truck comes in, goes yellow, right? There's the yellow. This is where the person who's in the truck goes. They close the door, boom, you know, they, they shoot it. There's the truck. Um, but you're seeing the, again, you know, the structure that's propping and this is, this is in compression, and then, you know, bringing light in. You know, in this case, the earth comes up against the building, and then you get this slot of a kind of floating condition at the um, exterior. And then these are those letters that fold up underneath. Um, so one more here is the um, Zarega Avenue. This is an EMS station in the Bronx. And uh, this is a very little building. It's like fire department EMS, one of the first buildings uh, that EMS built up in the Bronx. And it has a lot, again, a lot of movement and cars and you know vehicles going in and out through this little structure, as well as we're trying to move the air through it. Um, and we tried to think how we could bring as much um, you know resiliency, obviously, to the roof, and then. Um, natural ventilation as possible. It's a very rough and ready building. It, um, you know, this is really open so that they can hose all this down in here um, and the vehicles are going in and out. And um, <laughs> these, this is this giant gusset plate that um, is bolted rather than um, welded. And some of the interior conditions where we're just exposing a lot of the workings of the building here. And the roof of the building was meant to be a fifth facade. There's a, a very you know, large uh, NYCHA building, and this, this, this little building serves it as well. Um, so this is a view from that roof. And the roof um, is the first EMS station or fire station for the city that had a green roof, which they, they did not want. And then they were kind of saying, oh, we have the first green roof but you know, we had to convince them that it was a good idea. Um, but some of the details, like the handrail that, you know, we're, we're, we're very into handrails, but kind of leaning in so that it doesn't, it's not seen from the outside. You know, whenever you have a roof, you've got to have a handrail. So just buyer beware, because it's something that you're, you kind of get at the last minute and it's not, not a pretty picture. Um, we have hydronic hot water and solar tubes. Um, for bringing natural light down into the building. And it's, um, we worked with Kate Orff, landscape architect from SCAPE on this, and she and I argued with the city to have a, we're really, a cistern, so that the water, there is a community garden next door, and um, this was, this guy's there, but there's a community garden in between, and we were really keen on having the water from the roof be captured here, and then there's a spigot that goes in and the community garden gets free water, because we were kind of taking over the spot where their water was. So finally, this is all to kind of talk about a project that we're super excited to be working on now. You know, you always want to, you're always most interested in what you're doing right now, right? Um, and this is for the Energy Advancement Innovation Center at OSU. And it's a project that, um, it's going to support research and development. I'm going to just read this here for the next generation of smart energy systems. So it's really a renewable energy that they're, they're working on here. And they're going to be drawing down from this solar canopy. And this is a new campus. Like every campus has a new tech campus or a new incubator campus. This is Ohio State's new West Campus. Uh, the, none of these buildings are, actually this one's just going up right now. The whole campus is over here on the other side of the river. This, this is our little building. Um, we worked with them um, to shape 
make sure these were kind of clear of the solar, let's say that, it, that we get enough light on our building because we need the energy, right, off of it. Um, this is the program that we have inside. We've got um, testing pods, all kinds of, it's not really wet labs, but they're, they're drawing, as I mentioned, they're taking parts of this DC power and it's coming right down into these labs and they're working directly with DC power. The building is all electric, so we're trying to, we're tried to run the whole thing off of the grid, but you know, there, there are challenges right now with mechanical systems and warranties and things like that, but we're running as much of it as we can. But I wanted to talk about a little bit about the process for, you know, making a project like this and you know the number of models that you go through that you just iterate you know you've got all your maker bots up there which is what we've got too and we're just looking at um, you know different configurations and shapes both in order to make sure we get enough light on our roof um, but also you know, configuring that program so the gestures, for, for a number of reasons, um, of gest gesturing towards a plaza, kind of facing um, the east, bringing a lot of light into the building. Um, and these are just some of those little study models that we, they're just lying all over the place in our office. And then they kind of get a little more and more involved. And then the roof, so, so a solar, you're doing a solar farm in your studio or something like that, right? So, fair to mention that to me. So, you know, we, we wanted to bring this idea of this 900 panel solar canopy to this building as both, you know, iconically, but also that it's really working, right? It's, it's all, it's the renewable energy that they're working on in the building. But, you know, the, the systems, the racking systems are not, you know, you guys, they're not, you know, the prettiest. And so we were studying these things and we were studying um, how to group them, what kind of framing we would have, do we need to have steel around the edge, can we have a ragged edge? So, you know, we were just making models to look at those and then we realized that, um, that it was too solid, that we needed to bring light in through it. So we made a kind of plaid, like a, to bring air and to bring light and then this dappled light down to the piazza um, in front of it so that it wouldn't just be this kind of heavy lid on the building. So that whole system became a whole study project in itself. Um, so there's the wrapper, right, and then there's the building. And so here's two other models just kind of studying different iterations. Here we thought, oh, we'd have, we, I mean, this was impossible, right? Because <laughs> the panels are very precise dimension unless you're customizing the panels. And then here we have that steel frame, which we eventually got rid of, um, and we let the edge be ragged um, on the roof. So then a number, these are all real tiny little models that we're studying, um, you know, again here to see the light, the effect of the light coming through. And because the, the panels, we, we, we used the translucent material to try to get the lightness, but of course the panels are not translucent. They're not, you can have them in glass, but they're not as performative. Um, so we ended up, we're uplighting actually the canopy from below so that we can, it can be like our canopy in Messina, a kind of glowing piece to provide um, lighting at the end. So these are some more steady models of the building, trying to bring a lot of daylight into these working labs. Um, the east facade. Um, and then here's one of the, not the final model of this, you know, we have to open it up where the stair is and, you know, finding this kind of tartan grid to express the light. And then this is a larger model where we are here, you see now there's no edge, there's no steel edge, right? It's very light, no edge, we're trying to express the edge of the panel, like the glass at Corning, we're trying to express that edge so that you understand what that is and it's not just caught in this big frame. This, this model just cracks me up. So this is an intern. Um, so making a model, this is really funny. So we stacked them up, the thing just crashed because he made it out of paper. But we, were, we again were studying, because we're using precast on this, but we wanted to have a very, because it's tall, 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 
these are like tremendously tall precast panels, and we were studying this very soft, a very soft slope. So we have precast, we have polycarbonate, we have glazing are the three materials. Um, these are some of the samples. And then we, this was like not that long ago. We just rolled out one of the whole segments of the facade in our office at full scale. So this is full scale, the section of that um, facade, and we're looking at it, and it's like a Fibonacci series um, that we're developing that goes on the facade. And then we were, in some of these models, we're studying again the effect of that light on the facade. So you see it's very raggedy. I like that kind of raggedy business up at the edge, up in that top. Here's a rendering, you know, of the model. And um, this is that the very large kind of curtain piece, which is softer, the polycarbonate clear glazing. Um, there's a large um, meeting room in here. But you get, again, this, this sense that the, these are much lighter. Remember, we had the big steel around the edge, which, which we were working very hard to get rid of. Um, and then again, this gets uplit. So this was taken not that long ago. This was taken yesterday. Lindsay from our office is out there. And um, it's in the ground, so it's very exciting. And this is the view of it from the west plaza that it sits on where there will be, this building is, is going up right now, but the, you know, we were pulling away also so that you could get a, this view of the stadium from the open space. There'll be another building here. But the idea is to create this, this very transparent condition um, moving from east to west. And then I wanted to end, because you guys had that, that outdoor competition that you just did, <laughs> I didn't realize it, but we, Galia Salomonoff and I did a pavilion with a seminar in the spring of 20, just last year, 2021, when everybody was in lockdown. And we, they were gonna build this very ugly tent behind Columbia. We started calling it the ugly tent, and we just said, why can't we just make, a new, make our own tent? You know, so then we did this seminar called The Outside Project that we um, designed and built and had fabricated this inflatable with a seminar of students. And then by the end, we were all out there building it and you know, blowing it up. So here it sits between Fairweather and Avery. Um, we used climbing rope and steel um, up as lentils that we brought up and put above some very nice faculty's office windows and um, raised it up. And when it went, um, I don't know if this is going to go. Maybe it won't run. That's too bad. It's a very fun animation. No? So when it, um, when it first night it was up, the students all posted, oh, we'll go, we'll dance underneath the thing. So they were doing this whole kind of crazy dance the first day it was up. So it was so much fun. We were so happy to see people out and having fun and just, you know, enjoying being outside. And these are the students that worked on the project uh, in the seminar. And we're doing another one, crazy as we are this semester. So thank you. Okay. Good. So thank you so much. And I don't know if anybody has questions or we want to. Marion. <laughs> Models, particularly, particularly this last one, the kind of generosity with which you're showing the kind of the clumsy iterations that become more and more intense and precise with decisive... The ugly stuff. The, yeah, with really decisive agendas that you're holding true to. And I guess the question, because it was public projects, private practice, mm -hmm. is there anything that comes from, that, that, take, that is given birth in private projects that has influenced some of the work that you're doing in your public projects? Yeah, everything. <laughs> I just decided not to show the pub private project. But no, I think we started, uh, you know, when you start, and, and that was you know, in the office, you know, when you start and you're doing a lot of lofts, and part of the thing we were thinking about, and I know Henry was thinking about, was how do you set off what you're doing from what you're in, right? You're kind of articulating something new in this shell. And I think a lot of, Maybe some of the work came from that. I mean, we were so excited when we got our first footing 
we did like a tiny little canopy for Rockefeller University and we were like incredibly excited. The ferry building has no footings, by the way. So we had no footings that we'd ever done. But um, I think, you know, this notion of, of trying to really articulate not just what's new, but also to make something extremely light, you know, extremely light and of, of a, different, a different materiality. So, I mean, that's just a kind of quick comment. But I also always wanted to build an inflatable. <laughs> just, just saying, just saying. <laughs> We're going to do another one too. We're trying to improve it. Yeah, it was fabricated in Barcelona. But yeah, there's a great company that made it. Yeah, and we brought it. And anyway, yeah. So, I mean, that's just, but I think in private practice, it's when I was a student at Cooper, way back in the time machine, we had, I remember Frank Gehry coming and talking, and he said, um, you know, any project you get, you try to make it your own. Even you should take a garage. You know, he's in LA. Make, make the garage, find something in it. So we, you always try to find something in it that, you know, you can kind of work and make an idea. Um, and so I think we always tried to do that in each project. But there's obviously a kind of strain that's running through it all. But it's a number of people, you know, so it's not like the singular vision. Pardon? Oh, the rotunda that Charles worked on, Charles Renfro. Right. I have a film of Charles Renfro made of the pouring of the concrete. It's so boring, it's so funny. But he's a real architect, he was so excited that he was actually pouring concrete. <laughs> Annette. I don't, I don't really have a question, I just wanted to thank you so much for the lecture. Um, and seeing the details, you know, for, and anyone who's ever worked in your office learned how to draw details mm -hmm. uh, and learned how to think through details. And hearing you speak, you know, uh, it just reminds me of the inventions that can happen within, say, an inch of material. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, you know, just seeing them again makes me realize the kind of rigor that the office is based on around these kind of material conditions uh, and around... A, 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 a slowly evolving, ever more precise realization about how material and form and edge uh, and just the kind of nuances of surface arise, you know, uh, over and over and over again. And we see that kind of refinement mm -hmm. all the way up to the present. So thank you so much for that. That's, you know, thank it you. came from like a dream in my head. <laughs> <laughs> thank it's you. just wonderful to see. Thank you. Henry keeps saying we'll have this... Um, library of details, which of course is never going to happen. <laughs> you know, then we'll, have, we'll be able to take from this and put it here. This, this, this whole idea doesn't really work. But anyway, thank you. No, it's, it's always changing. So anyway, but thank you. Yeah. It's moving, yeah. That's good, because we didn't have to air condition the building because we could just get the natural air to go through it. So that was great. Thank you. It's getting rough and ready. There's a student? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, the uh, the Willis, um building looks incredible to me. Uh, and you also mentioned that uh, there are uh, moments, uh, you know, there are like nerve wracking moments uh, during checkings. So I'm just wondering if the, the weightless sensitivity of somehow informing this, uh, these like nervous moments Wait, say it again. Oh, like... Um, I don't know if I'm hearing because of the mask. Oh. Uh, so, like, you mentioned there are uh, nervous uh, moments during the checking, checking points. Uh, At the border? Yes. Various uh, check-in points? Right. I, I, you know, I, I, I was um, thinking, you know, these moments can be pretty uh, nerve-wracking. Yes. Uh, right? Very nerve-wracking. So, yeah, so I'm wondering <laughs> if uh, this, like, weightless sensitivity of the building is somehow informing that. Um. Well, you know, I think we were, I, I can speak for myself. I think I was very naive about what a port of entry, I was just incredibly excited to get this big project. And I actually thought we were, that the building would be like a visitor center that people would go in. <laughs> but you don't go in there. But the, yes, it's very stressful. You have everybody, even if everything's fine, you're driving up, right? And, you know, we wanted to uh, you know, kind of acknowledge where that line, you have no idea where actually the line is either when you cross. And so the idea that the facade has the letters on it or that the other has a mesh screen with the United States. Um, but what, 
what really happens is there's all kinds of sensors in the under in the roadway and it, they, they almost know everything about you by the time you get up there because they're taking a picture of your license plate you know so you can just I don't know if you can feel comfortable or, or be terrified but um, you know I think it, it is it's it's and all that you know is to say that we just wanted to make it you know a the kind of lightness of that moment, but it's it's not like we can make it go away, you know. I mean, we. It's funny. I was on a jury at the GSD with I think Julie Snow gave a border a, a port of entry project, and we had some people from the GSA there, the General Services Administration, were the client for the project, and they're great architects. By the way, they're really super smart, interesting people, and they said one of them said, you know, it. It might be at some point that we don't need these buildings anymore. You know, maybe they could, they might become some, something else too. I mean, that was like a whole idea to me. I don't know if it looks like we're going down that road, but it could be that all of this could happen in, I mean, maybe that's a bad thing too, that it would all happen electronically. But, um, you know, right now you see people, somebody looks at you, you have a conversation with somebody. You know, I don't know if that's a little more reassuring or not, but... Um, you know, there is that transaction moment. And, you know, we designed the booths for that and, and the lighting and all that for the people that work there, which is a very, it's a tough job. You know, they're sitting in that place and you're, you're trying to make it also uh, as pleasant a workspace as you can. The whole building, you're trying to do that. They just were, they thought, they would have been happy with a concrete bunker of concrete block. That's what they thought they were getting. You know, they had no, they, but, the, you know, we gave them daylight. I, I feel like, I mean, that's kind of, for me, the, reward of doing public projects is that you're working in the public realm and you're you're representing the public, right? And you're giving these people that are working in there hopefully a better workspace, right? That's what we're trying to do in that case. But, um, you know, I sit on this thing in New York, this public design commission, and, you know, like as an architect, you're, I always say I'm looking for trouble. I'm always looking for trouble. Like you go on a job site, you're looking for trouble, and I'm looking for trouble at the public design commission. But you know, I try to represent the public and, you know, try to make, you try to make the, it a better place. You try to make the city a better place. You try to improve whatever you can. Um, and it's, it's, it's big and messy and ugly, right? Even looking at the campus, like I know Annette has to do here. So, but I think working in the public realm is, is very sad, gratifying for our office. Um, and, you know, we've managed to hang in there and work in that way. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.